Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. So good to see everyone. Everyone doing good? Ready for winter to come in a couple you know, weeks? Yeah, I know, just thought, and it's a touchy subject, I know. I understand the climate we're living in. Don't touch about that. Don't talk about that. But we're so glad that you all came, and we're thrilled that you came to join us this morning. I mean, you know, Jesus is alive in this place. He's real. And you know, one thing that I, I really appreciate about God is when we're, what we study, so I have to give my face to my iPad so it, I can open it. <laughs> to set my face on this thing, otherwise it doesn't open up. But what's so wonderful is, you know, the whole Word of God is not desired for, designed for you and I just to have doctrine. Of course, it's good, but it's also for us, it's to be experienced for you and I. And this, what I love about it is the Word of God came not just to give us, you know, new teaching, although that is good and necessary and vital, but we can also experience it. And that's what we're going to continue talking on this morning. And, uh, you know, I was just in, in our time away. You know, we had a great opportunity. We went to Vancouver for about a week and then Kelowna for a week. And it was a great time. We had just a nice time getting, getting away. And I said this before, you know, it's like when you go to another place with your kids, people call it vacation. I call it you watch your kids in a different place. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great because, I mean, really, it's, it's a nice to have a little bit of a different scenery. Just you're up way earlier than you were before. So did we sleep? Eh, not really, but I got a lot of hours in the day, so I enjoyed my holiday. I was up a lot more than I was sleeping. So yeah, thank you for allowing us to go. And I know you had a good couple, three weeks going on. It was some good stuff going on here. And uh, of course, Julian, you were the best. Like, I have to give that. Like, he, I heard, did you hear him last week? He was just, well, you know, last week, you, you know, Dave's here. You know, this week was really good, but last week was even better. So Julian, got to toot your horn. And of course, my wonderful father, Pastor John. Nobody beats Pastor John. I mean, that guy is just something else. So we're so thankful for all those that took care. Uh, if you got your Bibles, let's go to Malachi chapter 3 there for a moment. I'm, before we jump onto this, I want to just share a few things that are stirring in my heart a little bit, and then we're going to talk about honor. Sweet. Two people are excited about that, and the rest of you. Honor is an exciting opportunity. It's an opportunity. And really, this is the culture of heaven, and so we're going to discuss it and talk about it again. But I want to just share with you, you know, in these last days, what we are seeing I mean, with everything that's going on, is a divide, right? There's a bad divide that we're seeing, right? Of course, you can see that. You can turn on the news and see what's going on there. But then there's also a good division. And what I mean by a good division is because, you know, I've heard lots of prophecies, words that have gone out, and I was actually listening to one uh, last night. Anybody heard of Dr. Ed Dufresne? Yeah, some of you heard that. Well, maybe you haven't. But in 1999, I heard a word that he had in 1999. He had a visitation from the Lord. And the Lord talked to him about these end times that we are now living in. You're going to see a great divide in the church. Not about face masks. <laughs> You're going to see the difference in between the word and spirit church and the flesh church. And you're going to see that more and more as we continue to go forward. And the verse that the Lord showed him is a lot of times that maybe you hear it for offering, but in Galatians chapter 6, it talks about those that sow to the Spirit, you'll reap life. But those that sow to the flesh, what are you going to reap? is corruption. And so just talking about that, there's a division that's taking place. So don't be surprised when you see those types of things take place. Right? And it's good that you, you hear that and that we're aware of it, not so that we can you know, judge and go, well, you're just flesh. We're, we're not talking about that. We still stay in the love of God. But just the, it's the way it's going to go because people will refuse to hear truth in these last days. They're, going, they're getting hardened, more hardened in their positions that they're taking and the stances that are taking place. So it's vital for you and I to remain humble because humility is the way forward. If you want to pursue forward in these last days, humility is vital for you and I, that we don't just think we got it all together, that we know everything. We just keep an open heart towards the Lord, and we allow him to direct us however it may look, right? Because as long as we get hard, we become unmovable. So we got to just stay pliable in, in this season that we're in. So the way forward is humility, right? And I want to just read this verse to you in in Malachi, and it kind of just shows a little bit of the difference that you're seeing. And in Malachi chapter 3, I'm reading it to you from the Message Bible on the screen. It says, God says, you have spoken hard, rude words to me. And you ask, when did we ever do that? Verse 14, he goes on to say, when you said it doesn't pay to serve God. What did we ever get out of it? When, did, when we did what we said and went around with long faces, serious about the God of angel armies, what difference did it make? Those who take life into their own hands are the lucky ones. They break all the rules and they get ahead anyway. They push God to the limit and they get by with it. Anybody ever heard somebody talk like that before? 
And you kind of see that, right? And it's, it's sad. I mean, because of this, the season and the time that we're in, media being a big thing, you can see a lot of people that were strong in the Christian world all of a sudden peter out. What happened to all that? Well, you, you can kind of see it right here. This is a, not all of it, but a small smidget of it right here. It's, hey, well, look, look at the world. They're still blessed. They're still healed. They've still got a great time, and they're not serving God. Look how fun they're having it. How come they're making all the big paychecks? How come they're getting all this stuff and I'm not? So what happens? They start to get hardened in their heart, and so they, what do they do? Start to tend to go this way a little bit, right? But then look at this, verse 16. Then those whose lives honored God. Everybody say, honored God. Those whose lives honored God got together and they talked it over. All right, that's you and I in this room right now. This is a God-honoring, God-fearing church, is it not? Come on, am I in the right place this morning? We honor God. We love him. We respect him, right? It says those that they got together, they talked it over, and God saw what they were doing, and he listened in. Now, this, this isn't just hypothetical. This is real. It says a book was opened in God's presence, and minutes were taken of the meeting. When the names of the God-fearers written down, all the names of those who honored God's name. He wrote your name down. He's listening to you and I conversations because we honor him. I think that's kind of cool. Right? So what is God doing? He's eavesdropping in on our conversations. Just what's, what's he saying over there? What are they saying over there? He'll hear you. Now look at this, the very last verse, 17, 18. It says, God of the angel army said, they're mine, all mine. They'll get special treatment when I go into action. I treat them with the same consideration and kindness that parents give the child who honors them. And it says, once more, you'll see the difference it, take, it makes between being a person who does the right thing and one who doesn't, between serving God and not serving him. So let me encourage you, stay on God's side. It may look like the world is doing okay. It may look like somebody in your company is doing better off than you. But let me encourage you, stay steady. Stay faithful. Stay committed to the ways of God. Stay loyal to his ways. And the end result is when God gets into action, he'll be the first, you'll be the first one on his list. Amen. Don't forget that because when God honors, whoo, watch out, payday comes, and it's rewarding. right? And that's why we're going to continue talking about this life of honor because really the life of honor is the rewarded life. Okay, now how do we, just answering this question, but how do we give our lives to honor God? It's the, just a reason here, by living our lives according to his word. That pleases him. That is honoring to God. The same way that my children, when I lay out a, an idea, or when I lay out a culture in our home, and they obey that, what happens? It pleases my heart. And what do I want to do? Dude, here's another balloon. <laughs> you know what, I'll even let you pick your color. That's so good of a father I am. And then my kids just sing around me, you're a good, good father. I know I am. I know I am. <laughs> you know, just over this, you know, little bit of time, even in praying as well, just this word time kept coming up in my heart just as I was praying last night a little bit. But give time to become intimate with his ways. You have to give time to it. Nobody just, you know, again, it's not osmosis. You can't just lay on your pillow, put this thing underneath, and all of a sudden, boom. I'm a spiritual giant and I got my mind renewed. No, it, it requires time. You have to give yourself to this word. You have to give time to it. But when you sow to the spirit, you're going to reap life everlasting. So it is well worth it, right? Even though the world's not doing, well, how come they're getting blessed? When the right time comes, it'll, it'll benefit you greatly. That's what the Lord says. So I want to just remind you and I this morning that you are an ambassador of Jesus himself. That's who you are. I want to just remind you of your call. You are not here to just take all and do a job. You're not here just to fill up space. You're not here just because your mom and dad had a good time and you were the result, right? There's, there's more to you than that. Aren't you thankful for that? No, somebody got to be a little bit more thankful for that. Already thinking about your parents is already disturbing enough. God, there's got to be a reason why I'm here. Three people are just nervous right now. Like, what's he going to say next? I don't know either. I don't know. Well, let me just read this to you. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. I want to, again, remind you and I that we are ambassadors. So it says, Paul is saying this, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, I appeal to you and beg you to walk or to lead a life worthy of the divine calling to which you have been called with behavior that is a credit to the summons of God's service. In the Passion Bible here, it says that as a prisoner of the Lord, I plead with you to walk holy in a way that is suitable to your high rank. Everybody say high rank. You got a high rank. 
You're a high-ranking soldier in the army of God. This is who you are. It says, given to you in your divine calling. This is what you have. This is who you are. You have received a high calling. So I want to encourage you again that you need to have a different picture of your calling. Your identity is not your job. It's not in your money, your education, your culture, or even who you vote for. Especially what we're seeing in this time. Well, I'm a conservative. Well, I'm a liberal. Well, I'm an NDP. I'm a block. I'm a Green Party. Whatever it is, that's not who you are. We start to identify with those things. I'm a masker. Well, I'm a not a masker. That's not your identity. Right? When you get to heaven, thank God there's no mask there. So it's, you can't make that part of your identity. But you just, the, you're making, it, the dangerous part is, is that we be, can make our identity on this natural playing field. And that's where God never called you and I to be. We are in this world, but we're not of it. So stop making your identity part of this world. It's not who you are. It's not where you're part of. You are an ambassador temporarily sent here to bring the culture of heaven into this earth. You and I are here for an invasion. We're here to invade, not to take up space. We're here for a great takeover. And so we have to have an ambassador mindset that wherever I go, I am carrying now a kingdom. I am carrying within me a culture. And wherever I go, when I say in the name of Jesus, I release a culture. I release power. Every time that the Lord calls you or asks you to do something and you step out on obedience, you've released two things, the presence of God and the power of God. Every time you obey in the smallest of things, whether it's a phone call to a friend, whether it's going seeing a neighbor, whether it's bringing cookies to a friend, whatever it is, you've released two things, obedience, or sorry, in your obedience, you've released power and presence. That's the most powerful thing. That's what you and I do. We are ambassadors for this kingdom, and we're temporarily sent here. So again, what do we need to do because we are this ambassador? We need to relocate ourselves mentally. We have to relocate ourselves mentally. If we stay stuck trying to fight a natural battle, the devil will have us whipped because we're just tied up with natural things. What does the Bible say? What's our fight? Is it in the the natural? No, it says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not carnal. So we're not fighting on 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 this side of light, right? So what are we doing? We're engaging our thoughts with throne room realities. This is how we win. We keep our focus in the right spot. Again, why? So that we can properly and effectively bring the culture, bring the atmosphere of heaven to this earth. We're here to invade the ap- and bring the atmosphere of heaven on this earth. And I'll just show you this last verse. In Colossians chapter 3, it says, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights. We say, set your sights. Set your sights. set your sights on what the political platforms are. No, and it's good to be informed. There's nothing wrong with that. But you don't set your sights on it. The sad thing is, is Christians know more about all the policies than they do the Word of God. People know more about the COVID rules than they do the Word of God. And guess what? COVID rules change on a regular basis. Can't do this. Oh, you can do it now. Don't do this. Well, you can do it now. You can do this. You can't do it now. It's constantly changing. And so what are they trying to do? Keep up with it. Forget about it. Stay focused on what this Word said because this is what you and I are called to think. We have to relocate ourselves mentally, and in doing so, now we're able to be an instrument to bring culture and atmosphere into this realm. That's what we do. That's what we do, man. Okay. Set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of this earth, for you have died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. So again, what are we doing? When we gather together, we're here to honor God and humbly ask him to teach us his ways so that it's not just doctrine to us, but it is now a culture that we've experienced and live in day to day and carry with us everywhere we go. This is not supposed to just be head knowledge. This is not just supposed to be something that we learned about in Bible school one time or I heard a preacher say this along. No, this is supposed to be experienced. And that's what I love about God is that this is an experienced book Cool. I'm glad we're on the same page. And let me just finish this. We're supposed to be different, right? We're supposed to be different. So now let's talk this. The culture of heaven. The culture of heaven. Why honor? Because it is the atmosphere of heaven. This is how heaven operates. So again, I want you not just to think, we're not talking about honor in the sense of, okay, we have to learn a new attitude or learn a new behavior so I can act here. No, I want you to think of it a little differently. You are an ambassador sent from heaven to this earth, and now this is the way that this kingdom operates on this earth, right? 
So rather than from looking from, you know, from earth up to heaven, back down to earth, I want you to already start in the position of heaven, and I'm temporarily sent here, and this is how the kingdom operates. Because what happens then, it becomes behavior modification, and it won't work. You'll be great for a week, but then maybe you're going to fall back into it. But if you can see yourself, renew your mind to thinking, I am an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm sent here on a mission, then honor is no longer something I'm attaining to. It's who I am. I am an individual of honor. I am a man or a woman of honor. This is who I am. It's in my DNA because I've been reborn. It's in me. Okay? We're okay this morning? Good. You're just looking at my tan. Is that what it is? Maybe it's... I'll quickly throw this in. Guess what I did this whole, this vacation? I read an entire book. Some of you want like, oh, what's the big deal? I don't really read novels. I don't remember the last novel. Do you remember the last novel that I read? I think it was like a book report in grade nine. And it was a Robert Munch. <laughs> like, <laughs> what's the book about? No, this was, this was my brother. He was, he was worse than I was when it came to book reports. The teacher asked him, he's like, hey, man, so uh, Javen, can you please stand up and you know, tell the class about your book report? And so he said, what was the, what was the title of your book? Uh, Dr. Seuss. <laughs> so teacher would like, Javen, that's the author. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so obviously... D minus. They, everybody liked Javen, so they didn't fail him. They just passed him on, let him, let him continue on. <laughs> but yeah, I've, I never really read novels because I mostly just read a lot of teaching books or whatever. I've read a lot of those, but when it comes to novels, I read 42 chapters this holiday. <laughs> Man, I'm a good reader. I tell you, I just, I was so impressed with myself. Okay. Now again, the culture of heaven is honor. So why are we talking about honor again? Because it is the culture of heaven. Secondly, but living a life of honor means that you trust Jesus. You know, but living by honor is going by faith and not by sight. Living a life of honor is living by faith, not by sight, because do you always want to honor? Let's be real honest. Do you always want to honor those that are in authority, those that are around you? No, you don't, right? Somebody could have said something nasty about you. What do you want to do? You want to give them a piece of whatever you got, you're going to give it to them, right? Especially in the culture, in the season that we're living in now, when everything is, it's actually applauded to dishonor everything in sight. They applaud that. In fact, they give you rewards for doing it. You'll get a peace reward for doing it. If you dishonor, oh yeah, you're the man. You're a progressive thinker. Yeah, you are. You're it, man. You're the real deal. Man, it's stupid. Absolutely. Herb? Stupid. Herb always fills it in for me. And those that don't know, Herb spells stupid, S-T-O-O-O-O-O-O-O-P-I-D. So that's how I've, I've learned that from him. It's just stupid. It makes no sense. So we got to go back to what the word says. But living a life of honor means that you're trusting Jesus. That's what it means. And so I think with the season that we're living in, what's really happened since March of this time is we actually came to the place you had to do your own kind of soul searching on the inside and find out where is my trust actually located. What's going on? Do I trust the Lord? Do I not? Am I depending on a building? Am I depending on what's going on here? So a lot of people were shaking this because what's happening, what's going on on the inside of you is going, what's, what do I believe? What is actually reality? What is true in my life? Or is this just something I say because I've been a Christian for so many years? So it was a great opportunity for you. And I think it was a, it was a four Sabbath that you and I were in. And so we really had to come and make some decisions on our own self going, okay, what do I actually believe? Okay, I'm glad we're all on board on that. So, now, if we'll learn to live this life of honor, the way that heaven operates, expect to see rewards. Expect it. Rather than asking God constantly, God, can you please bless me? God, can I see this happen in my life? God, I need favor in this. There's nothing wrong praying, praying for some of those, but if you would just get in line where the reward station is, then it just becomes automatic to you. Right? So look at this, 2 John chapter 1. Again, you know you've read this verse but it's been about three weeks since you heard it, so I'm going to read it to you again. It says, be on your guard. Here you say, be on guard. Be on, guard. Be on your guard. Be on the same way that mask of Zorro. Anybody seen Zorro? Yes, what do they do when they're ready to fight? <laughs> what do you do when you're on guard? Why? Because there's an enemy there. You're ready to go. So it's the same way the Holy Spirit is telling you and I through the Apostle John. He's saying, be on your guard. For what? So that you do not lose all that you have diligently worked for, but that you receive a what? Full reward. Anybody want a full reward? 
I want a full reward. I don't want partial, and I don't want to miss out on a reward. This shows me two things. Number one, I have to be on guard. This is my responsibility. And the second thing it shows me is that God is a rewarder. He loves to reward. The same way that you parents, any good parent, what do they want to do? They want to reward their children for good behavior. Right? God doesn't just reward for no reason. That's a big one to understand. Well, God, just because I'm your kid, can't you just reward me? He already has done plenty enough for you and I. But anything added and extra is not just because, well, I, you know, I showed up. Simply you and I just, I mean, the same way for our kids. We don't just, hey, you know, you have whatever you want. You, were, you just hit your brother? Have a balloon. <laughs> oh, you just kicked your sister? Good job, buddy. Let's go to McDonald's for dinner. We don't do that. There has to be some incentive. And it's the same way in the kingdom of God. Okay, let's go. So what are we doing? Why am I on guard for my life? Is that I make sure that I receive a full reward. This is my responsibility. I can't pray for this. I can't fast for this. I can't just, oh God, I need, I need, I need. It's something that I align myself up to. I align my life to. When I understand and live by the life of honor, these rewards come to me. I'm becoming a reward, reward attractor. Okay. Again, honor is a choice. It's something that you choose. And because you love God, you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the fear of the Lord is actually on the inside of you. So now because the fear of the Lord is on the inside of you, honor for you and I, if we allow it, simply states this, because I see a leadership position, I don't wait for them to earn my respect. I automatically give it because I see the Lord's authority on your life. I mean, I tied that in from a couple of weeks ago. If you need to hear that, go back and listen to that. But that's, that's the fear of the Lord on the inside of us. We don't have to wait for somebody to show respect or be nice to us before I give honor. The fear of the Lord in me gives honor because of, because of my love for Jesus. Okay, three amens. Okay, now look at this. This is a spiritual law. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 30. The very end of that verse, it says them, that those who, oh, it says those who honor me, I will honor. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. This is a spiritual law. Everybody say spiritual law. So this isn't a suggestion. This isn't if you get around to it. This is a law that's in the heavenlies that will not alter, will never change. We got to get this. The same way for us on this natural earth, gravity will always be there. If you're thinking one morning, ah, no, gravity's not going to be here today. You jump off that building, you will fall. Why? Because there's a law in motion. Well, this law is constantly in motion. What is the law? Those that honor God, he will, everybody say will, will. honor. He will honor. Those that honor God or those that honor his ways of doing things, God will honor them. Okay? Go through the Gospels. I encourage you, go through it and go through all the different times that Jesus, you know, either he did a miracle or somebody received a miracle. And I want you to notice that every individual to some degree showed honor and respect for Jesus. That's where it all comes down to. Of course, we know that it is, I mean, by faith they received it, but you can't even operate in faith without proper honor. If you don't even honor the Lord, there is no such, there, faith is very difficult to get. <laughs> if you don't have respect or show reverence for God, there's no way it's going to work, right? So you look through the Gospels, you find out every person that receives something from God, honor is in the mix of it. Okay, now on the other end, so those that honor God, he will honor. But on the same token that that's an absolute author or truth and reality in the spiritual world, so is this. And those who despise me will be disdained. That is spiritual law. It's not there to scare you or I and to go, oh, he's so mean. No, it's to show us the reality of this. This is law. Here's it with me, law. If you break the law, what's going to happen? The law's coming after you. This law is reality, and this is the law. And those who despise me will be what? Will be disdained, the NIV says. Disdained. And what is that word dis despised? When, when those that despise me, it means this. Those that look down on the ways of God or see his way of operating as irrelevant, what's the result? They will be disdained, meaning there is a disregard for these individuals in their needs and in their prayer. Y'all, did you just hear what I said? Because of this law, if we choose to demeanor God's ways, oh, I see that God, I don't want to do it that way. By just operating or thinking that way, what happens? We've actually just put ourselves in a position where God overlooks us. 
Not that he's angry at us, but we've positioned ourselves out of his way. He can't see that. He ain't going to operate like that. He's not going to bless you for disregarding his ways. Okay, and this brings me to my next point as a quick reminder that what we are in is a kingdom. Heaven is not a democracy. You're never going to see me starting a new campaign to go against King Jesus. Make heaven great again. <laughs> Will never happen. Why? Because it's a kingdom. Jesus is the king f- forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And just when you think his term is up, guess what? It's forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever again. So what we are in, we are in a kingdom. And in this kingdom, this is not a democracy. What he says, what the king says, and how it works. So listen, the best thing that we can do is just jump on board with what the king says and start working with it, and we start to reap the blessings and the benefits that it has in our lives. Not just because of the blessings and the benefits, but because this is what our king wants, so this is the way I'm gonna be, this is the way I'm gonna live. We gotta get it that way. Is everybody okay? We're on the we're on the same page, we're good. Okay, this is how it works. <laughs> I love that this is not a democracy. I think I said that to Marcel when I was babysitting him one time. And it, <laughs> It kind of worked, but. (laughs) Again, so what I want to make mention is that a proper balance with this, because we talked, you know, over the weeks about honor. We had mentioned about civil authority. There's four different groups or four different, um, those that have been delegated authority that we see in the New Testament that God commands us, not gives us, you know, an option. He commands us to honor and really to submit to. And one is civil authority. There's church authority. There's the family authority, and then there's social authority. That's the one I was looking for. That's the fourth one, social authority. And so we've gone over and talking a little bit about the civil authority, and that's been good. It's been great. And what that means, I want to just clarify a few things again, because the Bible instructs us to unconditionally submit to authority. The Bible does not tell us to unconditionally obey authority. Now, I want to clarify a few things in this because there's a difference between submission and obedience. Submission deals with the heart. We say heart. So when you hear the word submit, a lot of people just think comply. That's not what that says. Submit means I respect in my heart. There is a reverence on the inside of me for the individual, right? For the, for not the individual, for the office, I mean, for example, the prime minister that we have, I didn't vote for him. Doesn't mean that I have to dishonor the man. Maybe you love the man. Listen, true honor is not seen in people that you like. It's easy to honor people you like. It's the easiest thing to do. Honor is tested when it's those that you do not like. You don't like your boss. You don't like who the prime minister is. You don't like what, you know, my boss says this or what, you know, whatever it is. Anybody that's in those places of authority, that's when honor is tested and revealed. We actually see what's on the inside of a heart. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> it's, it's okay. We're going to talk about this. Because when you hear, and they, I want to just bring this out because a lot of questions have come to me about wearing masks. And, well, you know, I've, I've heard this and people actually say, well, Pastor Joel says we just have to wear a mask. I did not say that. I did not say that at all. But what I am saying this is what I'm saying submission simply means this, that in my heart I will respect those that are in this position of authority. Now, if I mean, you know what they're saying, we have to wear a mask for this. Well, you know what? There's a, there's a few ladies that are in this church that actually started a gathering to meet up and just actually not necessarily have a great crazy protest against, but just to show, no, we are about freedom. I totally support that. Our, the, way that this, the way that our government, the way that it's set up here in Canada, is we actually can say, you know what, I actually don't agree with this. And you can actually voice that opinion. And there's nothing wrong with that. It gets wrong when you're doing it out of a wrong motive. You're doing it out of a wrong heart where you hate the individual that's running this or calling the shots and you're wanting, no, 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 no. That's not it at all. But here's the thing. If I'm choosing to go into Walmart and they have a mandatory mask rule, I will put one on. My house, my rules. So if, guess, if you don't want to put on a mask, order groceries. If you don't want to wear a mask, find another place store that isn't doing it then. But going into the store and say, I'm not putting one on. Remember who you're an ambassador for. Remember that. Because if you walk in there and make a huge stink in Walmart, I ain't doing that. Y'all are stupid. 
And you say, I do this in the name of God. And you, you can actually see videos. I've seen, you know, they call them Karens. <laughs> and if your name is Karen, I do not mean that in any kind of way. But they throw that out there because you see all these things. Hey, look at this Karen. And it's just these people. And they actually have these masks on that say, God's got this. And they are freaking out at clerks. They're freaking out at people. It's, and you know what's, who's getting represented? They see him and go, you Christians are all the same. So I want to just encourage you, if you are going to go to a place where masks are mandatory, if you're going to cause a fuss, you're going to cause a problem, don't say you go to Impact. I got enough on my plate already with all that. This has been one crazy year. I don't need another one of these phone calls coming in. Hey, one of your members caused a big stink in Superstore. I don't need that. You don't think I get those phone calls? I get those. I'm for real, y'all. Who are we representing? We're representing Jesus. So, and again, if you are a mask wearer, we don't, and not only that, we're not going to con- or judge or come against somebody that has to wear one. I'm not going to go against that. If you want to wear one, go for it. If you like the way they look, go for it. If you like the way you can breathe in it, have at it. But does not mean you can push it off on somebody else either. So we have to keep this fine balance. Again, because you can get so hardened in your heart, you could look at somebody wearing a mask and go, you stupid, you don't know anything. What does that do? It automatically caps your ability to reach that individual. And the same way you're wearing a mask, you'll look how stupid those people are. They ain't wearing one. You've just capped your ability to reach and actually have a quality discussion. So does that kind of clear it up a little bit? I just wanted to make sure that we hit that because there's been a lot of questions. Joel said wear a mask. I did not say wear a mask because I myself, I'm not for masks. So I'm just leaving that out there. You can do with it as you want. Okay. Now, and the reason I bring this out, I want to show you another, I don't have this on the screen, but the Apostle Paul was really quick to understand this authority. This is who we are. And I, I'm, Acts chapter 23, I'm going to read it to you real quick. Now this is Paul, and he's being questioned by the, the authorities. And he says this, Gazing intently at the high council, council, Paul began, Brothers, I have always lived before God with a clear conscience. Instantly, Ananias, the high priest, com, uh, commanded those close to Paul to slap him on the mouth. Now I want you to see this. But Paul said to him, God will slap you, you corrupt hypocrite. Now, Paul was right in saying that. But notice what happens. What kind of judge are you to break the law yourself by ordering me struck like that? Those standing near Paul said to him, do you dare to insult God's high priest? Now, notice Paul's instant reaction. I'm sorry, brothers. I didn't realize that he was the high priest. For the scriptures say, for the scriptures say, say with me, for the scriptures say, for the scriptures say, You must not speak evil of any of your rulers. What was running Paul's life? The word. So rather than reacting to a situation or acting out, he was now reacting to what the word had to say. This is where we have to live. Put on a mask. How dare you, you corrupt hypocrite. And all of a sudden you hear, well, this is the the prime minister's coming in. He ordered that in. So I didn't know that the prime minister was entering the room. Can you see that? Where you cause the fight is, I ain't doing that. I ain't bound down for that. You've lost honor in your heart, and therefore there's no reward. Can you see this? Because again, all authority has been ordained by God. So you're not going against the man. You're actually going against God. I want to get into that. That's what we did last week. So let's talk a little bit about social leaders real quickly together. Everybody still doing okay? Nobody want to hit me in the parking lot afterwards? Okay. Maybe? Okay, good. Because that would be dishonoring. (laughs) You can hit Julian instead. I'm just kidding. That would be dishonoring. Just keep your hands to yourself. (laughs) But I am for fighting. If somebody were to ever come against me or my wife, I'm in covenant with that one. I'll break your arm. And then pray for you afterwards. I I will. All right. (laughs) Love you. Can we just go back to worship where it just felt so good? And we just, oh, you're never going to let it. Okay, but let's talk about this social authority. Who are social leaders? Social leaders include bosses or employers. They include teachers and they include coaches or any of those in social authorities in those places. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 1, it says this in the Passion Bible. It says, instruct every employee to respect and honor their employers For this attitude presents to them a clear testimony of God's truth and renown. Tell them to never provide them with a reason to discredit God's name because of their actions. So it could also read like this, that every student must show respect and honor to their teachers. 
You know, I don't know about you, but when I grew up, if I got in trouble with the teacher, guess what? I was in trouble at home. Anybody else ever get that? Woo, son. It was the teacher's fault, Dad. I don't care. <laughs> He's sitting right over there. <laughs> and you could also read like this. Every athlete or every dancer must show respect and honor to their coaches. Okay? So you ever heard this statement before that we want to make Jesus famous? Anybody ever hear that before? Well, can I show you? This is one way to do it is by honoring your boss, your teacher, or your coach. It's one way to do it. So why honor them? Again, because the Amplified says it like this, so that the name of God and the teaching about him may not be brought into disrepute and blasphemed. So let me just give you the definition of these words. So why are we to honor those that are in social authority? I'm talking about those that we are coming in contact with in everyday use. It's because that the name of God and the teaching about him may not be brought into disrepute and blasphemed. So what does the word disrepute mean? It actually means being in low esteem by the public. And blasphemy means this, to treat God or sacred things disrespectfully. So what we're seeing right here, when believers neglect to honor employees or employers, teachers, coaches, or any social leader, it will result in society having a low esteem for the kingdom of God and can even lead to the point of treating God or sacred things disrespectfully. Remember, you're an ambassador. You're not representing Joel Housing. You're not representing whatever your name is, your family name. You're representing Jesus. So you're showing off him. So I'll just give you a couple things from a negative side. How has society treated the things of God with disrespect? Do you think that is the society treating the things of God with respect or disrespect? Woo. So who is that on? Who is that on according to the verse? That's on me. We don't like that, though, do we? It's on me. Because look at this. How has society treated it? Well, prayer is out of our schools. Right? That's one thing. Next, the majority of entertainment is offensive and atheistic. Dear Lord, i got to see one another one of those Netflix things that pop up. I'm going to slap somebody. It, it's ridiculous what you see. Next, much of the music blatantly insults God. And education says that those who even believe in creation are narrow-minded, and now they are even a threat to progressive thinking. I, had a, I remember I, got, I had an opportunity when I was in grade 9 to do a debate in my English class between evolution versus creation. It actually went really good. My dad really helped me with that. We, we had a great time putting it all together, and I actually won the debate. Who <laughs> <laughs> Felt good. Anyways, I won't get into that. But, you know, just another example of this. Um, well, really, let me just say this. On a positive note, that you and I, we have the ability to absolutely turn companies, schools, any kind of sporting team that we be involved in or anything that revolves a coach. We have the ability to turn that whole thing around and reveal the kingdom of God in a way that has never been seen before. You have that ability. So I'll just give you a quick a little example that I, that I was just kind of thinking through from my own personal life. Uh, when I was in Bible school here, it used to be Canada Word of Faith uh, Bible School that was going on here at the church. It's now called Impact You. Uh, but what, uh, during that time, I was working for a company, and a great, great company, and uh, they knew my situation. I was part-time in, in Bible school, so in the mornings I'd go to Bible school, and then I'd go work there in the afternoons. And uh, going there, they knew my job. They knew what I was doing. They knew I was part-time and all this. Yet one of the things, I knew this with all my heart, that I was there to do a good job because I came from another fire department, so I was working at another fire thing here in town. And so I did my utmost, my best, to make that company look good. I came there, my shift started at 12.30. I was there, 12.25, I'm there on the dot, ready to go. So 12.30 hit, I'm there. My job ended at 5, I'm there till 5. I was there for my shift whenever I needed to get done. There'd be the odd time that the boss there would ask me, I need you to go do a couple things a little bit later on. Uh, or would you mind sticking around? Sir, I'd absolutely love to do that. No, no problem, no questions asked. And on top of it, he was a nice guy. He, he would pay me a little bit extra. Sometimes not, but sometimes he would. But I noticed over that time that these guys started to watch me. And so I actually started coming a little bit earlier to have lunch with these guys because, hey, they had a lot of questions. So over time, these guys started asking me about questions. These, these are not Christian guys. Right? I mean, we're sitting down there, and the way you know, the lunchroom talk sometimes can take place, and ooh, these guys got a mouth. 
right? They, they know some stuff. But over time, they started asking me a couple questions about what's your religion and all this kind of stuff. And so, yeah, you're, are you like in a Catholicism type thing? And like, time out quickly there. Actually, before even this, in my soccer, I won't get into my soccer time, but people thought that I was a Jew <laughs> and that my dad was a rabbi because we go up together and they would just, I would walk onto a bus and they go, shh. And I'd go, what? Oh, somebody just told a nasty joke about your kind. And I went, my what are you talking about? He said, well, you know, being a Jew and all. I'm, like, I'm, I'm not a Jew. Well, I'm not a Jew. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> just to lighten the mood a little bit. They said, prove it. I said, I don't know how else to do it. So. <laughs> but it was just so weird. But that's, that's how what they thought of me. That's who, that's who I was to them. That's what they thought. So, but anyways, back to Centrotech. Come on, people. Just grow up a little bit. <laughs> you got to be able to laugh a little. So, and then anyway, so going to this, back to this guy, um, because I did my best to make that company prosper, I actually had the opportunity to share Jesus with them. I had three guys, or no, two guys, sorry, that came from that company would come to church with me. Simply because I worked with them. They knew what I was like. They knew that I was a normal guy. Notice what I did not do. I didn't go in there with the mindset, I'm going to save this whole company, so I'm not going to work. I'm going to actually just tell them all about the gospel. It's not my time. This is the time that I'm there from 1230 to 5. was not my time to do what I wanted to do. I was there on his dime. So what am I doing? I'm working hard. I'm giving my time. And out of that, they started asking me questions. I didn't have to go and start preaching to the whole group. That's not what you and I are called to do. We think all of a sudden, if I can just go in there and just preach to everybody, everybody listen. No, they'll be annoyed by you with anything. We're ambassadors, not annoyers. Tweet that. That's, Joel Housing, stamp that one. We're just, I'm just kidding. No, that's, I don't even know if that's a word, so I don't want to. But here's the thing. Titus, look at this. Titus chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. It says this. Slaves must always obey their masters and do their best to please them. They must not talk back. Say it with me. They must not talk back. Nobody wants to say that. Say it with me. They must not talk back um, or steal. <laughs> That's helpful. <laughs> or steal. Because what if I do, if all of a sudden I'm there from 1230, but instead of you know, doing what my job was, I was doing a lot of fire extinguisher checks and a lot of fire hoses working and things. Instead of doing that work, I would just go and say, man, do you know about the Lord? And I get him off of what he's doing and start talking to him. Listen, Christianity can go, oh, that's just the right thing to do. Not according to the word of God. From what I see here, our job is not to just go in there and just start preaching at everybody. Our job is to do the best job that we possibly can for the employers that we have. And if I do my best, it's going to be a testimony even more so than if me just going in there and preaching. I could have gone in there like a fireball. Nothing would have came out of it. Okay, let's continue reading. It says they must not steal or, t or talk back or steal, but must show themselves to be entirely trustworthy and good. Then they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive in every way. Let me read that last part again. Then they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. Come on, say it with me. Attractive. Why is the good news and the gospel unattractive to people? It's because we're not honoring. C can you see this? We think it's some magical biggest thing ever. If we would just simply honor those that are our bosses, our teachers, coaches, whatever it may be, guess what happened? You start to make the gospel attractive. Second, I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 1 or 4 or something, somewhere in there. It talks about us giving off a scent. There's an aroma that you give off. How do you smell? <laughs> what kind of Christian stench are you giving off? That's a big deal. Does it, is it attractive to people or is it, man, B.O. Christianity, man? Like, get that away from me as far as you can. And it's you just trying to pump something up when, in fact, you're just supposed to do right, this right here. Okay. So now with this, it is possible to display Christ's character in difficult environments and in work ethic because my actions speak louder than my words. My actions speak louder than my words. So I want to be an employee who works harder than anybody else who is honest and trustworthy, and I'll never argue, complain, or talk back to my boss. Okay. Now, 
So how do we honor social leaders? We seek to make them successful whether they, we are recognized or properly paid for. Can you do that? Prefer them over ourselves. Where I'm preferring this business. I'm going to make this business go. I want it to be better off. When, I, when I'm done here, when my season is done at this place, I want it to be better than when I arrived. Like that concept is gone. We're going to get into that in the next, next couple weeks or so. But that comes even to honoring one another. This is something my parents taught us as kids is that whenever you even get a vehicle, you borrow a vehicle. I know I used to borrow my, my Opa's truck or whatever. Or whatever. Actually, it goes back to Opa really teaching all of this stuff too is the fact that whenever you would borrow something from somebody, you would return it even better than when you got it. So you borrowed it, you fill it up, and you wash it. But I only, I only drove four miles. It don't matter. You fill it up, and you do it better than when you got it. And what's happening? What are you doing? You're, you're sowing honor. Honor is like a boomerang. No matter what, it's coming back to you, whether you honored or you dishonored. And let me say one other thing about dishonor. Cho- choosing not to honor is automatically dishonor. <laughs> It's a big deal. And so that's what I want this company. Every time that I leave, I want this place to look better than it is when I left. And when you can live that type of way, whether they reward you or not, God's got his eye on you. And God is the rewarder. Thank God. I mean, if the employer is, God uses them to bless me, thank God for it. But he's the ultimate rewarder. I'm not looking for them to do it. I'm not looking for somebody to notice me. I'm going to just stay late and finish this up. I know it's not, I'm not getting paid for it, but if I just do this, Hey, I know his eye is on me. Who are you living for? Who is, whose eye are you doing this for? This is a big deal. In Christianity, this is huge for us. We are entitled to nothing. <laughs> okay. Let's read this. Ephesians chapter 6. This is the last. No, I have two more verses. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5 through 8. It says this. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. Anybody ever had done that before? All of a sudden, uh, you're just, you know. (laughs) Boss walks in. Oh, hey, hey, boss, it's so good to see you today. And he's saying, don't just do that even when they're not watching you. Okay. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all of your heart. Work with, come on, say it to me, work with, work with, work with, I'm waiting to see it, y'all, this should be like the price is right, welcome, or work with, I got picked, me, you want me to sweep the floor, I can't believe I got picked, enthusiasm, Hey, I need somebody to stay late. Can you clean that floor? Oh, are you kidding me? You always ask me. Ask that idiot over there. What's happened? Oh, I'm staying away from you. Forget honor. Forget the rewards coming your way. It says work with enthusiasm. I got to go to work again today. Work with enthusiasm. You don't have to go to work. You get to go to work. I'm going to just keep my COVID pay because I'm well. No, this is big, man. I'm, I'm, I'm fine, though. Like, I, I just don't want to go back to work. Yeah. Work with enthusiasm. Oh, but I'm making free money. Somebody's going to pay for that. Somebody is paying for that, and it's going to be you eventually with your taxes. Get off your butt and work. Praise the Lord. You're never going to let, you're never, okay. (laughs) Carrie, I think they want you back. (laughs) Okay. All right. Work with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will reward. Okay. Can you guys see this? Remember that the Lord will reward. This is verse eight. Remember that the Lord, remember, we say, remember, 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 remember what? Remember that the Lord will reward. The Lord will reward. The Lord will reward. What? Each one of us for the good we do, whether we are slaves or free. He will reward us for the work that we do. He will. He will. So I want to move past. Just I want to, uh, What I want to do is I want to develop a servant mentality. A servant versus a slave mentality. Let's talk about that here just for a quick sec. Because I want to just talk about servants. A, servants. a servant does maximum potential. 
A servant gives of his time rather than more of a slave mindset is, oh, I have, they're taking my time. Can you see the difference in that? Oh, they're just wasting. I got to work for it. What a waste of my time. No, a servant, you were investing it. Okay, next. A servant gets to, a slave says, I have to. A servant looks for opportunities. A slave waits for somebody to ask. Look for it. You see something that needs to be cleaned up? Go ahead and do it. Just get her done. Get her done. That's my Alberta accent. Get her done. (laughs) And last, uh, servants, they foresee the needs of the one he serves and fills them without having to be asked. With even outed. So let me encourage you, because if you're just thinking, I have to do this job, what are you doing? You're doing very bare minimum. Don't expect the kingdom of God, the culture of heaven, to come in and invade that place. You want to see something take over? You want to see Christianity go through the roof in this next year in this city? Guess what's going to take? Yeah, of course, we're going to pray. That's the foundation for everything we do. But on top of it, you can't just give it over to prayer and neglect honor. Oh, I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just pray for my boss. Yeah, that's good. Do that. But also, do your job. Taking a 15-minute coffee break when it's 10, you're stealing. Oh, I took a half-hour lunch and, you know, or sorry, I took an hour lunch. They gave me half hour. I just took a little bit of extra time. And we go, oh, that was a good one. You stole. And you're looking, God, I'm just wanting favor. Oh, your blessings follow me. Lord, I just need things happening in my life. You stole 30 minutes. And you're going, God, where are you? God's going, get in line to honor. If you'd honor, it's there. It's here. But you're hanging out here for an extra 30 minutes. Anyways, I'll leave that alone. Okay? But if you have, if, if you have an unfair or a harsh boss, anybody have one of those? My staff, put your hand down, Terry. Who's going to say? <laughs> you put your hand. <laughs> well, here, Terry, I got, a, I got a word for you, Terry. Since your boss is such a real jerk, Terry, (laughs) I'll meet you in the dungeon after service. All right, well. (laughs) But if you have one of those, and this is, maybe you really legitimately do. He's an absolute corrupt, maybe he's just a complete jerk, whatever. If you have that, you need to act instead of react. You need to take charge of it. How? By standing firm and I ain't doing that. No, (laughs) London like that. The person who reacts complains of how he's treated or mopes and is unproductive. But if you would act, you will attack evil with good, which is Romans chapter 12, verse 21. What instead of doing, instead of fighting evil with evil, you actually put good to evil and it'll change. Okay? He may, this is another idea, is that, sir, I'm just an example, that I see that there's extra work that needs to get done. I'm coming early next week to get it done, and I'm not expecting any pay. That is going over the top. But I I put an extra hour. So be it. Who are you looking to? This is what I find the whole problem is, is we're looking to government. We're looking to bosses to take care of us. I worked for an extra hour, and I didn't get my 15 bucks. Listen, the reward of God, he can supersede 15 bucks tremendously. So if your eye is still on the man or the woman or the, the guy, you're missing it. Jeremiah actually 17, verse 5 through 8, it actually tells it. Cursed is the man who looks for mere men to meet their needs. We're missing it. We're looking to men. When the boss is looking, oh, I'm just sweeping hard now, and we're expecting promotion to come. Promotion doesn't come from men. It comes from God. If you're waiting, I want to get promoted. I, want, I need a higher paycheck. I need more. Whatever it is that you need, guess who is the one that gives it to you? It's the Father. Now, he can't entrust you with more until you prove what you do with the least. All of a sudden, maybe you have a vision in your heart. you got something that you really see God wants you to do. He will not give you that vision until, first of all, you are given or you're working for another vision. You want a vision, but until you come to serve somebody else's and help that get accomplished, you will never do your own. Absolutely not. Because this, what we're living in this culture is so me-focused. And this is what I'm called to do. Great. But how does it fit in the big overall picture? I know that. How do I know that? Is because I served my parents for a number of years. 
Whatever I had to do, I started off janitor. And listen, this building at 2 o'clock in the morning is a bit of a sketchy place. I don't know how many times I'm praying in tongues and things were moving. Or you're not moving, just like you hear little creaks. Creak. I'd be so cool. And you, and you kick open a door with a pool in hand and a broom in the other. All right, nobody's there. Okay, good. Lord, no fear here. I'm good. I'm good. But anyways, we have to understand this. Because operating in this manner, over time, you will win the favor of God and your boss. Proverbs chapter 3, this is the last verse I want to share with you. 3 through 4, it says, Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. It says, Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with both God and people, and you will earn a good reputation. you got to earn a good reputation. Let me say it with me. Earn. This is the only thing that you earn. You earn a good reputation. And how do you earn a good reputation? What do you tie around your neck? Loyalty and kindness. And by doing those things, by tying those things, knitted around your heart, guess what? You're going to have a good reputation with God. Notice that, with God. <laughs> You'll find favor with God. I thought I already did. Yes, in Christ you have. But it doesn't mean you can just fluff off and not do anything about it. Now i got to live in the manner to which he's called me. I'll find favor both with God and, man, when you got that combination, you go far. You absolutely go far. Rather than whining what somebody didn't give you, I should have had that promotion. I should have got that job. They gave it to somebody else. Listen, you are simply reacting. What are you doing? You're moping. You're Nothing's going to take place. But instead, now act. What can I do? Right? And God will make sure that he gets it to you. Right? So again, if you don't find favor with your boss, with this type of honoring behavior, God will open a door in another place where you will find his favor. Because remember, honor is a law. Dishonor is a law as well. If you honor the social authorities in your life, God will honor you and you will be rewarded. It may not come from your boss, teacher, or coach, but it will come. God watches over his word to perform it in your life. He absolutely does. Are we all, we're all good here? Okay, I, I'm, I'm finished now with this. I want to just call up my wonderful wife for a moment. Because as we know, we're just going into a, a new season here for school, for parents. And uh, it's, it's just kind of crazy, right? It's, it's a little bit nuts out there. But what we wanted to do is really just take some time to, to pray for the school that we're about to enter into. Hi, yeah, we just had it strong on our heart just to send you home today. If you're a parent, maybe even a grandparent, um, or if you've got kids, your, kids in your life that you pray for, we've just printed off some declarations, things you can speak over your children for this year. I mean, it's not um, specific to school. You can speak these things over your kids all the time, but we've just really been reminded that us as the parents or you as the grandparents, the authority, the God-given authority you have to declare over your children, to speak God's word and his truth over them. And you know what? We always, every year that you send your kids out to school or whenever you send them out, even just to a friend's house, you're sending out your arrows, right? But we just feel like there's, a, there's an urgency in our spirit for this season that we're going into because as darkness seems to get darker, Our children who are walking in light are going to stand out more and more. So you're not just sending your kids to school this year or to their friend's house or to extracurricular activities if they open up. You are sending your children out as arrows with God's assignment. And so we want to declare a couple of things over the kids. And we don't want to touch today, but we do want to stand up. And so instead of grabbing hands, we're going to ask you guys just to lift your hands up to agree with us. We're just going to read a few of these declarations over the children today. So, Father, according to your word, we declare the children of Impact Life Church, the teenagers of Impact Life Church, are rescued from every trap and are protected from every deadly disease. We declare, Father, that these everything these children set their hands to will prosper. Lord, according to your word, they've got a high call of you on their lives. They choose life. They choose the right They choose your way of doing things. They are leaders and examples to many. Father, according to your word, you are in them, and greater are you in them than what they're going to come up against in this world. Father, we declare these children are filled with light. We declare these children hear your voice, the voice of a stranger they will not follow. 
Father, the children that are under the umbrella of this church represented here, we declare they're healthy, they're whole, they're protected from all harm, sickness, danger, disease, and plague. Father, we just thank you so much for them. We declare your anointing upon them and within them, Father. We send them out, Lord, with your Holy Spirit power to accomplish what you want to accomplish for them this year. And we also just plead the blood of Jesus over the schools of Red Deer, Father. Everywhere they set their foot is protected. They bring the peace of God with them into those schools. And they bring the healing power of God with them into these schools. We thank you for their teachers. We call them blessed and protected as well and we thank you father we as the parents have got your wisdom on how to raise them this year so we thank you for it now father god yes, you, in lord. jesus mighty name yeah amen so be it yeah that's just i want to just lift up one more sec just to the teachers for a minute because they've been going through tremendous well, changes on a regular basis i mean i was talking to my uncle who's a principal in a school here and he just said the the changes come every like second day it almost feels like so can we just pray for our teachers they need the wisdom of god in this time because, man, they're, they're, they're hosting our kids. So, Father, we just lift them up to you right now, every teacher, every principal, every EA. Father, we thank you first and foremost for them. We thank you for their abilities to teach. We thank you for their hearts to teach children and to educate them. Father, we thank you so much also for their protection. Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus over every teacher. And right now, Father, we ask you for the wisdom of God to surround them. We thank you for counsel, people to come alongside and to give them ideas, to give them insight for every situation that may come. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, will you pave the way? We just pave the way right now in the spirit for them. In Jesus' precious name. Amen.